I'd like to introduce our first speaker now. It's Ter Badia, who is the Secretary General for Culture Action Europe. We mentioned earlier the mapping that you've done to see how the different national recovery and resilience plans have or haven't addressed culture. And just to remind the audience, it is the largest amount of funds ever raised and leveraged at European level. So it's a key opportunity. What does your mapping tell us about the way forward and the place of culture? Good afternoon. And, and yes, as you mentioned, and in this joint effort that we did with our members, we carried out this mapping on the percentage uh, of investment in culture in the national recovery and resilience uh, plans across Europe. And the results of which um, indicates three things. Um, that despite this 2% that was mentioned already by Commissioner Gabriel, Gabriel uh, this 2% of or overall allocation for culture at new level, we see most of the countries below this number. And we are afraid so that this could lead to challenging inequalities between cultural actors and, of course, endanger the diversity and the participation in cooperation projects. Um, we see also that at the first sight, the majority of the investments will, will go to large infrastructure or to boost the digitization of the sector, with uh, very few exceptions um, that were already also mentioned. And that means uh, that the implementation of the investments of the national um, recovery and resilience plans will make difficult the access to these funds for micro-organizations, freelancers, self-employed, and intermittent workers that constitutes the very backbone of the cultural sector. But funding is just one side of the coin. There is a political and a strategic dimension that must be addressed for, for, for things to change. And let me explain briefly what I mean. First of all, there are ma these major challenges ahead of us. Equality, social justice, and, uh, and, and in addition to the climate emergency will not be achieved if we leave the entire current system unchanged. But nothing can change unless a cultural debate is included in the approach of the, uh, to these challenges. Without taking into account the cultural dimension embedded in human and societal behavior, and in that of the dominant system, contemporary concerns cannot be addressed in all its complexity. Secondly, we need to recast the narrative on which cultural policies have been based, revaluing culture itself and also expanding the spheres in which, in which culture operates, which is clearly not limited to the economy. And thirdly, we need to guarantee fundamental cultural rights. This is key. The right to access and participate in cultural life, cultural production under fair and dignified working conditions, or the right to cultural diversity and freedom of artistic expression as an essential counterweight to injustice, as well to critical thinking and the stimulation of public debates. We have several policy tools to start addressing the structural challenges in the cultural ecosystem. And one of them is surely this next work plan for culture, the roadmap for the European cultural policies for the next year that will be negotiated and approved during 2022. And we understand that this is the one, this is one of the fundamental and decisive tools that the member states have to converge toward this common European cultural strategy. We need a strong cultural sector. We need support for its workers and the recognition of the critical value to create and sustain new paradigms. Many of the topics that we will discuss in this afternoon are constructive approaches to issues that are relevant to the cultural and creative sectors today. Important issues that we would like to see reflected in Europe's overall cultural recovery and in the work plan for culture. And I think, uh, I, think I use my time <laughs> today. So thank you so much. Thank you very much for giving us a first good overview and, and s ringing a small alarm bell to say that yes, more money is going to culture, but largely it's going to big institutions or to digitization. And we mustn't lose sight of the fact that the vast majority of the cultural sector is independent in precarious work and is freelance and this needs support. And on that issue, I'd like to introduce Elena Politseva, the head of policy and research at the IETM, that's the International Network for contemporary performing arts. Working conditions is a prominent topic, both of the campaign Cultural Deal EU and the current work plan for culture. Where do we stand and what do we still need to do? 
Hello, everyone, and thank you very much uh, for this panel. I would like to start answering this question by challenging a little bit the very subject, so very title of this panel, Culture for Recovery and Sustainability in Europe. I think that instead of talking how culture can help Europe to recover in a sustainable way, we should talk about how Europe can help culture to recover and actually become a sustainable sector. Um, this is about changing the discourse, changing the discourse, meaning that we should stop seeing culture solely as a useful resource for all kinds of other sectors and all other fields of public life. We should stop over-focusing on the so-called spillover effects for economy, also social cohesion, and for green transition, etc. Instead, we should think how culture, because we should recognize, and it's, it was said today many times, I think it's clear that culture has an unquestionable value for us. So let's just focus on how can we make the cultural sector itself a fair, inclusive, equitable, and sustainable sector. Um, culture is also an integral, it's an autonomous sector, but it's an integral part of economy. It employs millions of people who are highly skilled uh, and who are very well educated. And these people do not ask for a special treatment. They ask for an equal treatment, meaning that they deserve access to social security, they deserve proper working conditions, good wages, sustainable careers, and a sense of stability. So um, this sector, um, which in this regard, um, in the view of this plea to shift the discourse, what should the work plan for culture 2023-2026 address? I personally don't think that this plan should talk about the role of culture in this or in that, in green tradition, or in well-being, or anything else. The future world plan for culture should focus on topics which are relevant for the big theme of working conditions of artists and cultural professions. It should address social security, intellectual property, fair remuneration. It should address gender equality, uh, freedom of expression, and inclusivity of the sector. I know that some of these topics are currently also part of the work plan for culture, but we, don't, we cannot say that these issues have been solved. So there is a need to continue discussing them. My final point will be also about money. As cultural advocates, we're asking about money all the time because cultural sector deserves more financial resources. But just as Tara said, just more money is no longer enough. More money should not create more work, more activities, more projects without creating better conditions. More money should mean better remuneration, fair remuneration, better, better working conditions, and also structured reforms, which can actually bring sustainable change in the cultural sector. Um, and all these, with all this said, beyond the work plan for culture, why wouldn't we imagine a new agenda for culture? The current so-called new agenda for culture of 2018 is, has not embraced all the transformations we have been living through, especially in the last two years. And that new agenda for culture should definitely embrace the shift of discourse from exploiting culture to supporting culture. I think that's it for now from me. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Elena, and particularly for us to challenge the way that we speak about and conceptualize culture, that it doesn't exist to serve other sectors, but it deserves its own focus and attention. Let me introduce Inez Kemara, who is going to the co-founder and director at Mapa das Ideas. Let me ask you to pick up on something that was mentioned earlier, which is the idea of having cultural rights. What role could a strategy based on cultural rights play in our conversation about the cultural deal for the future? Well, thank you, Tam Tamsin. Um, hello, everybody. Um, while I was hearing everybody in this very inspirational afternoon, I was in fact thinking about that. What are cultural rights and what is this idea of a full cultural citizenship? And um, the first uh, thing that comes into mind is this repetition, almost a redundancy on repeating over and over again that culture is what brings us together. Culture has its intrinsic value. And then in a certain, certain way, it's always disappearing from the agendas it's always disappearing from its role, as Delena put so well, um, as a sustainable way of life and uh, an achievable way of life. And um, I really have to think that we really have to point 
the, the action into this idea that culture is a part of the way that we are citizens. In a certain sense, it's a part of the way that we are European citizens. And that's about uh, a Europe that is uh, working towards social cohesion, but it's also this Europe that is open to the world and has always had this multicultural approach to values and to influences. And because of that, we do have cultural rights. And because we are cultural citizens, we also have to give each and every European citizen the possibility of taking responsibility for their own cultural heritage and for their cultural participation. And we can only have that if we have a creative sector, if we have cultural professionals, if we have creators that have artistic freedom and have good uh, working conditions, because we can't expect them to overcome over and over again difficulties just because they are always two step ahead or outside of our usual bubble. So when we're talking about this idea of cultural democracy, we have to think that we're talking about voices and choices also. And this kind of um, programs many times are closing or shutting down the voices of the smaller, most innovative organizations. And if we invest in digitalization, we're not putting money into creation. And that sometimes is, is what is going to save us as a dynamic society, because democracy is in fact dynamic. So I wanted to put the, the underline of my speech in that three points, the artistic freedom, this idea of us having choice and voice, our cultural rights, and um, for us to execute every day the principles and the values of the Porto Santo Charter, as it was a dynamic process from different actors all across the European Union. Thank you so much, Tamzin. Thank you very much, Ines, for sharing that. And I think this is really important, the, the making the link to artistic freedom, but also the voices and choices message. We're now going to share with you some of the inputs that you've given us via Mentimeter. We're going to see the word cloud that you created. We asked you the question, what topics do you want to be addressed by the next work plan? And you can see, well, uh, I can tell there are a lot of people online with loads of ideas, so it's hard to see, but I can see that there we've got in, in the middle, we've got issues of inclusion, sustainability, diversity, participation and in innovation, key issues, I think, that reflect the way that the cultural sector has responded and supported society in the last few years. But I'm also seeing social security. We heard earlier about the importance of addressing fair remuneration. The idea isn't just to extend the cultural sector where you have another generation of people coming in with very poor working conditions, but it should actually a place, be a place for dignity and for decent work lives. So thank you for that. And this is, as we see, you can see it changing in real time, suggestions for people that they've put forward. We have a few people who we've invited to comment on what we've just heard in some of those messages. And let me invite uh, MEP Monica Semedo to, uh, to speak. You are the rapporteur of a known initiative report on the cultural recovery of Europe, which we've heard mentioned. And that was overwhelmingly approved by the European Parliament at the end of last year. And you identified better working conditions in the cultural and creative sectors as an area for priority, as well as the issue of mobility, educational opportunities, and artistic freedom, all of which have been touched on so far. Now, the Parliament doesn't have a formal role in, in this, the process leading to the adoption of the work plan for, for culture, but what would you like to see member states prioritise in that work plan? Yes, uh, thank you very, very much for having me, and uh, thank you for all the speakers for their very interesting and fruitful insights. And also, uh, I would express my big uh, thanks to my colleagues in the European Parliament that have adopted, as you mentioned, um, uh, this in any report uh, last year with a big uh, majority. And there you can see that we, as uh, MEPs, we support the cultural and creative um, sector. And for me personally, it was also an important uh, topic as a former uh, master of ceremonies and journalist and uh, and TV host uh, and independent. Um, I was totally aware of the problems that 
existed before COVID, but were enhanced uh, to uh, COVID. So, uh, yeah, we were in a difficult situation during the COVID-19 crisis and still are. And the uh, cultural and creative sector was one of the hardest hit uh, from all sectors and is still suffering uh, under the, 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 the restrictions, for example, because uh, venues are closing uh, long-term projects. You don't have the, the security that they will definitely happen let's say in the in the end of the year and also the travel between uh, the member states was uh, very very difficult i just remember that the borders between luxembourg and and germany where i live on the border uh, were closed and we were all shocked and of course also artists and uh, creatives um, so many artists have uh, have shown the following uh, problems that the unsteady flow of income uh, didn't give them security and planning security, which is important, especially when I'm thinking of, of women um, that have uh, children or men that have uh, children. Uh, so there is no financial backup. There was no financial backup. There were helps, uh, but I will come to that a little bit later. And also the, ac the lack of access to uh, social security uh, was in, in danger to healthcare and also to pension systems. Problems that were existing before that were enhanced by the COVID crisis. So uh, the issue is likely to persist. And uh, that's why I think this report from the European Parliament was very, very important. So we were addressing uh, two main issues. So the economic recovery of the cultural and creative sector. So immediate help with all the facilities, with all the, all the programs we have uh, uh, in the European Parliament and the EU institutions. And of course, the social and economic uh, security for artists, which will mean a better resilience for the whole CCI uh, sector on recovery. Um, we have the uh, recovery fund and the Parliament has stressed many times uh, and especially Renia Europe, uh, my group uh, has uh, insisted that member states uh, invest 2% of the recovery and resilience fund into the cultural and creative sector. But uh, we have shown also in the report, uh, and uh, we are also asking for further uh, detailed numbers on the spending of member states and investing, not spending, investing in the cultural and creative sector. Um, what member states have have done so with the friends of my cultural and creative friendship group uh, we have draft, drafted an, um, an, an a question to the commission uh, where we really ask for numbers because if we don't have the numbers we don't know how much support uh, there was and how it will prevent also disparities uh, in the EU cultural and creative sector. And I hope also that the Council uh, will recognize the importance uh, of supporting uh, these uh, sectors in their uh, work plan. On social security, uh, I just can say from my personal experience as an independent and freelancer back then, um, you were not allowed to be sick, although if you were, uh, then you have to have to see how you can make uh, ends meet at the end uh, of the month. And this is important for the resilience. And let us not forget, we have many women that work in that sector. They are still underrepresented. And we have many young people that start their career here. And we have to see artists as individuals. And uh, as we cannot we should have harmonized standards, although the competence uh, of the uh, EU is here uh, not uh, given. So important is social security, pension and health uh, insurance uh, schemes. Uh, and uh, one important personal thing was um, also giving artists the possibility to develop their career. Means also training, because artists can be very, very creative. But you need also entrepreneurial skills in order to develop uh, your talent and uh, to have a living of it. Uh, and uh, so what the EU can do is improving uh, 
of course, the training, for example, but also the working conditions. And this was mentioned, uh, mentioned from the former uh, uh, speakers. So we have some countries that can act as best uh, practices, uh, and we should look at them and see each member state should see what they can adopt. The EU is about exchange. Uh, the cultural and creative sector is about exchange. So we should take that seriously and try to see who does it best and improve. Um, so uh, just uh, as a last uh, sound, um, I would like to see uh, also the council work plan uh, for culture to have uh, more an emphasis on the mobility, um, the movements uh, within the EU, uh, social benefits, of course, and uh, digital transformation. We have seen that also the cultural and creative sector is dependent on uh, well-functioning. Other, other points would be women, so mm -hmm. gender mainstreaming, uh, training, and of course, diversity and inclusion. So these were the main points of the European Parliament. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Monica. I, I can, listening to you, I can really get a sense that this is an issue close to your heart and the passion with which you managed to take the own initiative report right the way through to get such a strong support across the parliament. You mentioned, of course, the, the role that the member states will be making in their cultural action plan. I'm delighted to introduce the current presidency of the European Union and the next one. So let me start by introducing Guillaume Madinier, who is the cultural attaché at the French Permanent Representation to the EU. Now, of course, you're in the process of just initiating the, the work on the Culture Action Plan. Could you tell us you know, how, how this process is being started and how will you make this as visible and strong link between the recovery of the cultural and creative sectors and the next multi-annual work plan? Um, yes, hi, bonjour uh, Tamsin, bonjour à tous. Je, je promets que je vais parler anglais, je voulais juste uh, vous remercier en français uh, de m'avoir convié à représenter la présidence française. On, nous sommes très heureux de, de participer à cette discussion et de, de vous écouter. Um, maybe as a first reaction before I jump in the, the work program process, um, a reaction to everything that was already said and the different um, topics that were mentioned as being very important. I'm glad to see that these are all topics that were identified by the French priority, uh, presidency, sorry, as priorities to um, work on in the council. Um, the MEP Semedo mentioned mobility and we are in the process of working on council conclusions on reinforcing intercultural exchanges through mobility and through um, multilingualism. So I think in that sense, we're very, um, we're on the same page in terms of um, priorities, um, the, in terms of recovery and recovery plans. I'm also happy to say that um, France was one of the countries that um, did reach the 2% target that was called for of, uh, by the culture deal. And we're happy, and we were very happy to see, as uh, Commissioner Gabriel mentioned, that um, at the European level, at the aggregated level, we did reach um, this this target of two percent. We were also extremely happy with um, having a increased budget for Creative Europe, which um, does respond to this um, call for more support to the cultural sector. Um, in facing the crisis. Um, of course, we can always wish for more, but um, that was, we should um, recognize when there's been a significant effort that's been made and, and celebrate this uh, victory as well. Um, we um, are also working on council conclusions for a European strategy for, industry, for the creative and cultural industries. And in this, um, these draft conclusions, we suggested to have a discussion on um, better supporting professionals in their access to uh, European funding. So I think that also replies to some of the comments that were made today in terms of making sure that um, the specificities of these smaller freelancers, independent actors of the cultural sector 
are taken into account. So this is something that we are very much paying attention to. Um, in terms of um, access to culture, this is also a priority of the French presidency. We um, are planning to invite um, ministers of culture to discuss at the council in, um, in April to exchange on um, methods for participation in cultural life. We, um, we realize that the current cultural policies implemented on, in Europe are mainly aiming at creating conditions for a diversified and accessible culture offer. And we want to also um, exchange on experiments carried out by member states to facilitate access from the audience point of view. We think it's, um, it's interesting to um, develop the participation of everyone and including young people. Um, and in terms of status and working conditions of artists, which was also one of the big um, subjects that uh, came out of this discussion this afternoon. Um, as you know, so we are tackling it through the, um, during the French presidency through this conclusions on mobility. That's one angle. And as you know, there is um, an expert working group on um, from the open method of coordination that is working on this top very topic. Um, it started in September and the results are due to be completed in 2023. So it's ongoing work. Um, and uh, of course, we are very um, attentive to what the parliament has been doing on this, on this topic. And to come back to, uh, to finish, with um, the work plan. So it is the work plan of the Council on Culture and it is meant to be a sort of um, roadmap of what member states, which topic member states want to work on together um, for the next three years. So the actual negotiations and uh, conclusions will be um, made under the Czech presidency. So our trio partner, but uh, not during the first semester. During the first semester, we are planning to start discussing. So it's really good for us to um, uh, participate in these events so we can hear also from the sector what topics you think are important. Um, and we will also start uh, discussing on the evaluation of the current work plan, which the Commission is preparing. So that's part of the plan for the French presidency. Excellent. I think that's it from my side for now. Thank you very much, uh, Guillemet, for sharing that perspective from the French presidency. And as you mentioned, you're, you're working with your colleagues in the, for the later half of this year. That's the Czech presidency. And I'm delighted to introduce Ivona Havel, the cultural attaché for the Czech permanent representation here in the EU. My question for you is clearly it's a little too early to say exactly what's going to be um, in the work plan for culture. But when we asked the audience here, what they thought should be priorities. You saw this incredibly dynamic, full of vision ideas. So my question to you is, is there a way to effectively create an exchange so that the cultural and creative sectors can be heard and help input through your presidency to the work plan? So uh, I would like to first thank all the organizers, because this event is extremely, extremely uh, full of energy. And um, as you already heard, the Czech presidency will continue on the work that uh, uh, is based on the current work plan. It's based on uh, other activities done under, under the current work plan. And I am very happy to uh, hear that also the representatives of other institutions as a commission and parliament are actually on the same board. And uh, I listened very carefully to what uh, other speakers said. I realized that uh, the priorities are actually not that, that much diverse that I was expected to hear. And uh, as uh, uh, already Guimet from the French presidency said, the, we are now under the, uh, the current work plan do, having the expert group on the status of artists. Mm -hmm. So the Czech presidency definitely feels this urge for this topic. And we uh, will, uh, even though we won't have the final outcomes of this work uh, of this group, 
we will uh, listen to uh, the working done by them and we will definitely uh, incorporate uh, the ideas of uh, what not only the experts are saying. Uh, you have to take into, into the account that the work plan is uh, done on the council level, therefore uh, most of the member states are expressing their priorities, but the member states are usually also representing their um, national culture culture field mm -hmm. they are consulting them uh, and uh, as you ask about the consultation we have uh, there is not any official mm -hmm. consultation with the culture sector foreseen for the moment because we feel that the uh, I'm sorry that the consultation that are going on on the on the level of the European Commission are still very vivid uh, at the other side, we are very open to listen to voices of the cultural sector. And I am very happy to heard that now there are more than 2,000 participants, more than 2,000 people from all around Europe listening to uh, the fact that now is the best time to uh, make their voice here. I do understand that culture is uh, all the time set as important and uh, then at the end of the day it disappeared for the uh, program or uh, it's only uh, it's only used as the source for something and I, I am pretty sure that the, my colleagues in the um, cultural affairs committees uh, have uh, the, the, or will do the best to support culture for the next work plan uh, in the way that we can uh, provide lines that will allow culture sector to uh, gray, to, to raise and to flourish. We all know it, we knew it from the beginning, only a lot of politicians and a lot of people around us didn't want to listen to us. So unfortunately, very negative thing as the COVID-19 helped other people to reflect upon this. I know that the culture was extremely uh, damaged by, by, last, uh, by, by previous years, but I'm perfectly sure that we all together can make a lot for it and that uh, we as the Europe will allow culture to grow. Excellent. Thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing what you can achieve during your presidency in the second half of this year. I'm going to bring uh, our session to a close. And I'd like to find out some of the conversation that we've been having in the chat. As, as you mentioned, we had a lot of people who signed up to watch us today. And we've been, we've been interacting with you. And I saw the Mentimeter, the huge range of ideas that people had of how they want to see culture represented. So let me introduce Gabriella Rosana from Culture Action Europe, who's been watching the chat and keeping an eye on some of the contributions you've made. So what have you been seeing, Gabriel? Thank you, Samson, and uh, good afternoon, everybody from uh, Culture Action Europe headquarters here in Brussels. Well, um, a lot has been said in the chat, indeed, very interesting conversations also addressing the various things that you have touched upon. And first and foremost, I mean, greetings for all over the world, I must say, also so some greetings from, Ch from Chile, and congratulations to the fantastic women we had in the lineup of speakers. Well, first consideration is that as cultural sector, and I think that's the lesson we are also learning today by being all together, we as three organizations that organized the culture and promoted the cultural deal, you and the many sector representatives online with us, that we as cultural sector have to unite the forces to be stronger and also stronger voice to be voices to be heard by the decision makers. Um, one of the things that you mentioned already at the beginning, indeed, something is that there is more and more evidence and recognition on how art and culture are benefiting the health and emotional well-being of individuals. That that is something that also our audience very much uh, believe in and wanted to see reflected also at the political level. However, there was. Uh, an interesting comment that received a lot of endorsement in the chat about the fact that culture 
and that was also echoed in the words of Elena Polizia, but shall not be viewed as instrumental. Let's not talk of culture and other things, but of culture as uh, such. And in that regard, um, the new agenda for culture that the European Commission adopted in 2018 was brought in the conversation. It, one of our um, participants says that it is already addressing relevant uh, issues. So let's go back uh, to, to that and try to develop. I mean, starting from that, maybe let's even adapt it to the new post-pandemic uh, realities. A uh, couple of more comments, uh, this time on the work plan for culture outside, let's say, of the Mentimeter exercise. Um, one of our participants said, indeed suggested maybe to align the Council work plan for culture to the multiannual financial framework. So instead of having four year time span, having it for seven year time span, uh, then until 2027. And in terms of investment, that was a word also used by Monica Semedo. Well, our participants suggest that investment should prioritize cultural education in schools. This is a topic that has not been addressed yet by our speakers, but also an increased budget shall answer to rural communities' needs, so beyond the urban areas and urban context. And two, um, other uh, things. One is that uh, for the French presidency specifically, it would be great to make sure that the non-professional sector will also be included in your actions during uh, your presidency and the semester. And the last one, well, we couldn't agree more with that. Creative Europe is still the smallest EU program, so maybe also food for thought for the next MFX. Thank you, Tamsin. That was it for the chat until now. Thank you very much. And, and as you say, lots of very interesting comments and contributions from our audience. And we, we look forward to seeing that conversation build.